And on today's show, how AGI and MAGI can set up the sale for tax advantage insurance products. Part one of this week's series on tax investment strategies with nationally recognized columnist Ken Davis, CLU, CHFC, CFP, and CPA. Hi, everyone. I'm Steve Savant, syndicated financial columnist and contributing author to Backroom Technician and Innsmark. Let's get down to business. Well, welcome to the show, Ken. Hey, Stephen. Well, you know, we were with you all last week. You're setting us up. This week, we're even going into deeper. We're going to talk about investment strategies that have tax ramifications. And of course, insurance products are a big deal about that. But we wanted to redux and make sure we understand this. And we're going to go through the 1040 because knowing how to use AGI and MAGI really can help not only your client, but you're going to be known for really coming to your client, giving cash flow because of your tax strategies. Ken, tell me why MAGI is becoming the new mantra for advisors. Well, it's interesting. Uh, Congress for a lot of years got a lot of heat for increasing tax rates. So they learned a long time ago, actually all the way into the early 80s, that the way to get around this issue of having you know, the nightly news say tax rates have been raised is they raise them indirectly. They chip away at the tax deductions, the exemptions, credits, and stuff like that. And how they do that is they don't do it with tax rates. They start with adjusted gross income. Do we have the, uh, yeah, the let's go to the page one of the tax? What's important for our viewers to understand is the tax return is kind of a nice way to get a quick education at a high level. You know, your growth, first you, you say who you are, what your exemptions are and your dependents and stuff like that. Then you start bringing all your gross income in and there's certain uh, deductions within the business income line 12, Schedule C, there's both income and deductions. So that, that's just summarize those there. Then we get down to certain kinds of deductions that are, are what we call above the line. They're above AGI. The importance of those is they're not affected by these formulas that reduce the benefits of deductions and credits. Those just stay put. Once we get to the bottom, we're at adjusted gross income. That number is then modified further. So first they adjust it, mm -hmm. and then they modify it further. Now, I think a lot of our advisors and people that have been in the business a long time, we have a pretty good handle on what's going on on the first page. We've been basing our practice and our understanding of tax advantage products based on AGI. To move to this next level, because it's really to our advantage to understand this, because we're actually so I thought this was the final number we were going to be taxed on. Now you're saying, instead of going to Congress and making taxes a new legislation law, which would be public and everybody would be at, that there would be an outcry, now they're kind of in this stealth move of making modified adjusted gross income. They're adding back on issues that are exposed to taxes now. Well, think about it. Even on, on the compliance forms, they ask what the tax bracket of the client is. And I'm, I'm telling you that it's meaningless because mm -hmm. the tax bracket is just the starting number. What happens is our gross income, our adjusted gross income, modified adjusted gross income, then impact whether we have certain deductions or exemptions or credits that are effective or not. And then we also have alternative minimum tax that guess what starts with mm -hmm. adjusted gross income and makes different calculations. So the thing is we can't just say, oh, the cap gains rate is 15 or 20% or the maximum tax bracket is 39.6. No, that's wrong. 39.6 is just the starting point. Mm -hmm. We added the 3.8% uh, Obamacare uh, tax. And that's it. not included in the 39. That's right. That's in addition to, and that whether that kicks in or not is based on, guess what? Modified adjusted mm. gross income. So uh, whether you have uh, medical expenses deductible, whether you can deduct certain IRA contributions, mm -hmm. uh, whether or not you get to deduct, uh, you know, certain kinds of itemized deductions and credits and exemptions, all flows off this. And to make it even more confusing, there's not just one MAGI. For each of these different elements and parts of the code, there is modifications to adjust a gross income for specific types of things, like Social Security, whether or not Social Security is taxable or not. It has its own MAGI. It has its own MAGI, and each one of these have their own MAGI. And when you're listening to the national news and they say income up to such and such an amount is you know, inc inclusive or, or taxable, they're not talking about taxable income. You would think they are, but mm -hmm. they're not. They're really talking about modified adjusted gross income. When we're looking at modified adjusted gross income, and how can I keep track of all the different iterations of MAGI? 
I mean, it would, if we had a, we probably should do an article on this. When we come back from the break a, um, a little later on, we're going to show you an article that Ken and I did that you can have on request. Just write me at steve.savon at ashbrokers.com. I'll send it to you. It actually walks us through some of these mechanics. But, but Ken, how many Magi categories do I have to think about then? Is there about three or four of them I have to kind of understand? No, no, no. There, there's dozens of them. Oh, my gosh. Okay. And, and I, you know, I don't know all the crevices in the code. I don't know where all of this is. But you pick up uh, various types of tax forms. You see MAGI everywhere or adjusted gross income is included. One of the main reasons we're talking about this for advisors is this, this is something we can do something about. We mm -hmm. can affect adjusted gross income and thereby modified adjusted gross income. And we can make the deductions, credits, exemptions they have more effective or make sure they don't get mm -hmm. phased out. We can uh, take away the taxation of social security income. Uh, Steve, this this blows me away. We we are no longer stuck with just the tax code. These things have ramifications at other parts of of the uh, federal law. Mm -hmm. And I'm talking about is Medicare premiums. Medicare premiums aren't really premiums anymore. The base premium is a premium, but now the additional premiums you have to pay, guess what? Are based on modified adjusted gross income. So it's basically a tax. It's a tax. Well, when we come back from the break, we're going to hit it. We're going to show you a little bit of the article, and we're going to go to page two of the 1040 and show you a little bit about MAGI. Back in the day, life insurance professionals were called field underwriters. Then, carriers trained their field force in the basics of life insurance underwriting. Today, the insurance industry doesn't educate the agent population as they once did. But now, you can have the informed risk guide at your fingertips so you can illustrate a reasonable rate class for your life insurance prospects. Just request your copy of the Informed Risk Guide at downtobusiness.ashbrokerage.com. It's free from Ash Brokerage, the practice enhancement company. Well, welcome back to our second segment. This is the article I alluded to in the first segment. It's on Producers Web, and uh, Ken and I both wrote this. Sorry that we couldn't get two pictures up at one time. Sorry, sorry about that, Ken. But look at all the credentials in the back of you, so I gave you the credentials <laughs> you got. This article is a great digest. If you're saying, Steve, I, I'm having a hard time tracking with this. Well, no problem. This really knocks down basic understanding. And if you want that article again, we'll send it to you at steve.savon at ashbrokers.com or you can go right out to producersweb.com and pull it right off my archives. Happy to do so. I want to go back to our MAGI, go to the second page of the 1040 and talk about this because to me, Ken, this is where we really need to start living. And I have to tell you, in full admittance, until I really got into this a couple years back when you and I first started talking about this, I lived on the front page. I just said 1040, here's your adjusted gross income. I went to the marginal tax bracket, computed out the progressive number. I now was done. Not so anymore. Well, I think one of the more significant things on page two is how capital gains is calculated. For instance, we all think that capital gains rates are 15%, right? or 20%, or I guess, for those sure. at 39.6 tax bracket. But in fact, what happens is the cap gain goes from Schedule D, flows to the front page of the return, flows all the way down through AGI, which then gets picked up here. When they compute the tax, they actually split it into two pieces. Okay, can, can I go back here just to make sure we're all talking the same thing? So when I put input capital gains on my sheet here, on line 13, it's going to affect my AGI. Right. In the old days, we were done. Right. Now you're saying that when we're talking about Magi, walk me through where it lands on this page. Well, what Magi isn't happens. really here. Magi is on each of the different elements as to mm -hmm. whether Social Security income is included, whether a deduction is deductible or mm -hmm. not, all those types of things. That's already happened before we get to this page. But what happens here is where the capital gain gets pulled out, they assess the 15 mm -hmm. or 20% bracket or the lower ones, and they compute the ordinary income. But what people think is, oh, gee, cap gains are 15% or 20%. Mm -hmm. Well, no, they're not. Remember, tax rates are bogus now. They don't really exist as we think they do. Mm -hmm. What's happened is that, let's say I had a $10,000 cap gain from the sale of stock. It actually flowed to the front page, goes to AGI. AGI gets modified to modified adjusted gross income, and that determines whether or not I have Social Security taxation, whether I have higher Medicare premiums, whether I get to deduct certain deductions or credits, which changes all those numbers before it gets to this last page, mm -hmm. may bump it up so that I'm in a higher tax bracket. So it, you know, I'm thinking I'm paying 15%, but the full cap gain, that full 10,000, mm -hmm. not $1,500, but the full $10,000 in that example flows through to AGI, which then 
blossoms into affecting all kinds of other areas of the code. Okay, so in Social Security example, because we have a lot of seniors that are still invested in the market, they're still doing non-qualified investing in mutual funds, ETFs, and so forth, mm -hmm. and they're receiving, they're, they're, they're actually getting their income, and they said they're celebrating, on page one at least, they're mm -hmm. celebrating, mm -hmm. they're celebrating the fact that they're paying 15%. But now that actually, the, not the 15% tax, you're saying that the capital gain, the entire gain flows through to the provisional income test, if I'm here understanding correctly, and then it becomes, it actually exposes more of your Social Security benefit to, for ordinary income taxes. Right. So the, the only way to, I mean, a lot of what we're talking about, the detail is overwhelming. It, it's, it's really difficult to take all this in. If you take away something, it's that, it's not necessarily 15%. You have to actually run it through your return before the transaction. Mm -hmm. Say, hey, if I don't sell this, this asset this year, mm -hmm. what are my taxes going to be? Okay. Mm -hmm. Then if I do do this, am mm -hmm. I only going to increase my taxes by 1500 bucks because I've got a $10,000 mm -hmm. gain? The answer is probably no. When you run it through the second time, it'll compute a new tax, which takes into consideration the impact that MAGI has on other tax aspects within this whole calculation process. This is really correlated, isn't it? Yeah. So what you have to do is take the new number and subtract the old number, and it and it's likely not to be 1500 It could be 2000 or 2500 or whatever. It depends upon all the other attributes of your tax return. There's no quick and easy way to say, oh, it's only going to be 15%. I think if seniors were up awake to this and found out that their capital gain treatment was affecting their Social Security, which actually causes a greater ordinary income tax event, and then looked at that number, that would be the real tax number. Well, and here's another way of looking at it. We've A lot of us have done calculations on whether somebody should do a Roth conversion or not. And the traditional way of analyzing that is based on what your beginning tax rate is and your ending tax rate, comparing the two. And we're going to do that more in the, mm -hmm. in the show later on. Uh, but the fact of the matter is that uh, you can make choices to do a Roth conversion, affect your AGI and your taxes one year, but then have every single year thereafter having distributions from a Roth to live mm -hmm. on as opposed to a fully taxable IRA you're going to have a, a completely reduced AGI going forward, which will save you mm -hmm. taxes, make your, your deductions, credits, exemptions work better for you, maybe get rid of alternative mm -hmm. minimum tax. All these things are impacted by keeping AGI down. And then later on, we're going to be talking about how the products, life insurance and annuities that we use, can be strategically used to monitor and control AGI, thereby getting better effective marginal mm -hmm. tax brackets. Well, that's all we have for the show today. Remember, before moving forward with any of the ideas you hear on our show, always consult your tax advisor, legal counsel, or your broker-dealer compliance officer. And don't forget, you can view all our past episodes of, at Down to Business at ashbrokerage.com. And remember, you could be a wiser as an Ash Brokerage advisor. Ken and I will see you tomorrow.